Hey everybody and welcome to another JASP tutorial. In this tutorial we're going to talk about one of the modules that you can add on. You don't have to add it on but you can if you want to. Add it on and um, do some really cool time series data interpretation with it. So I am here using the JASP 0.17 on Apple Silicon. Um, you can download depending on what you need, what your chipset is from Macs. Of course, uh, Windows is a separate thing. And down here, when there is like a basically an incremental release, you know, bug fixes, uh, these kinds of things, um, there'll be a click to get latest version. And what it'll do is it will open up. Uh, let me go grab that for you all just to see. It will grab. It will just open up it in your. Uh, browser where you can download the newest one. So I haven't updated yet. Uh, I know I, I try to do my do, due diligence when I do videos and I update it, but I, I kind of wanted to showcase that button. Um, I'm not going to download 0.17.1 right now to do this video because it's not necessary, but I did want to bring this up because I wanted to pull up release notes. And so in 0.17, we are going to talk about, pr oops, wrong button. We're going to, Okay, maybe we shouldn't do that. We're going to talk about profit. And uh, in 0 0.17, it was updated to allow prediction to be optional. So what is profit? Well, let me pull up a, another. Here's profit. Okay, so um, facebook.github.io slash profit is where, and not to be confused with P-R-O-F-I-T which is to make money more than your uh, cash flow, right? So your ins and outs, more ins than outs, right? This is profit, so forecasting. So this we're going to be doing time series analysis in this particular video, okay? Time series analysis. So uh, the JASP folks have integrated the R code here. So we're going to talk about how this module works in JASP. All right, and the easiest way to do this is to open up a data file in the main window. <clears throat> we're going to go up to the hamburger menu here, and we're going to go to open. And we are going to go to a data library. And the amazing thing about the data library is there's already a profit uh, data set here. So we're going to open this and I'm going to go through it. Now you can open up the .jsap wrapper or you can open up just the web page visit. I'm going to open up the wrapper, which has all the output, all of the notes and everything on it. So it can help explain. So it can help explain as I explain the uh, ways that you could use this. So this is perfect. All right. So I'm going to open up that. It's going to open up the data here. <clears throat> and first and foremost, you're going to see the module, profit module. You go up here to get it. But if you don't have it added, you go up to the plus sign and you just check this box. And so if I uncheck it, it's not there anymore. And if I check it, it's back. Now, the interesting thing is uh, when I closed it, it got rid of that wrapper. So what we're going to do is we're going to go back to open. And let's see, it's not in my recent files, which is really weird. But uh, I'm going to go ahead and open it again. Uh, so it, it opens up the output. And Kind of annoyingly, it opens it up in a new window, but you know, what are you going to do? Uh, if you haven't seen my other video, you can hit your alt keys to get keyboard navigation. Um, you have to hit control or excuse me, option to not do like full screen, but just to maximize the window in your space. So I'm, I maximize this window um, as opposed to making it full screen because I like having the title bar up here so I can move it if I need to. So profit, the profit module. So right now we have dependent variable is visits and this is jasp web page visits between january and october 2020 which is which is really fun because it, it's a data set that they could pull right from just their own uh, offices and it tells you how the data was set up but you know what we're going to go in here and we're going to set up we're going to look at the setup data ourselves so here we have date date is arranged as a nominal variable but it's also a string variable because it has the a in one of the venn diagram circles and essentially it's just date so it's arranged in the international way with year first, followed by month, followed by day. So going from largest time scale to smallest. And we just have, let's see if we go through this and we end up with 277 data points uh, through October. I'm sure if they added November and December, we'd end up with 365. It looks like a poll every day for visits. I'm not entirely sure exactly when they pulled it because in the it, it just has the year. It doesn't say when they pulled it, but that's OK. And then visits. This is what you can get from any regular uh, data analytics tracking on websites. You can just see how many people visit. I'm imagining that these are all visits as opposed to unique visitors. Um, actions, so clicks and things that they were going and doing. And then release, uh, let's see what they said about release. I'm not entirely sure what release is. A logical variable that indicates on which date a new version of JAS was released. Okay, so, all right. So we have, uh, as we scroll down, we've got a bunch of zeros. And then at some point, yeah, right there. So they, uh, 7 2020 they had a release. Okay. And then 721, they had another release. I'm, I'm assuming these are major releases as opposed to the 0 0.1, 0 0.2 uh, mid releases as we keep scrolling and scrolling and scrolling. Uh, okay. So a few releases in 2020. I mean, that was pandemic time. That was like in the middle of pandemic time. So what was happening at that point? Like what? Yeah. So you know what that means. So this is a variable that you can use in your tracking to help you out. So just to go, uh, just go back through it. Date 
Express in year, month, day, number of visits to the webpage, jazzstats.org, which is a great website, uh, number of actions executed on the Jasp web website. So clicking on release notes or clicking on download or going to the resources page, all that kind of stuff. And this example Jazz file illustrates a simple profit model uh, from Latham and Taylor 2018 to predict time series data. And then so here's the um, here's the reference. Okay. So before fitting, what you do is you want to get your history plot. But before we go into the output, let's look at the setup here. And I'll bring up the help file for this analysis so you can all look with me. So the dependent analysis is visits. OK, so that's the, the time time scale variable that you want to um, collect the time series. And then time is you have to have a, a, a variable that consists of time in a standardized format. So you either do why, uh, years, months, days, hours, minutes, seconds with colons in between. Or you can, oh, and you can emit seconds, uh, which uh, can where seconds can be emitted. So you can just do hours and minutes, or you can just do the date, so a full day. So that is what it's going to, um, that's what's going to matter there. We have no change points, but we could put in release as a change point if we want to, okay? Uh, carrying capacity is the time series variable containing the maximum values profit will predict at a given time. This is only used for logistic growth, okay? Saturating a minimum, the time series variable containing the minimum values profit will predict at a given time stamp. Again, only used for logistic growth, which is not what we're doing in this video. Covariates, anything that's associated with the dependent variable. So we could, we could throw in uh, actions and see what happens to it. And then include in training, logical variable indicating which case should be used for estimating profit, which is an equals one, and which cases should be predicted equals zero. Variable would be useful here. Okay, necessary for making predictions when a carrying capacity, saturating minimum, or covariance are supplied. Okay, so if you only if you have these three in your uh, data set, you want to track predictions, then you have to include a variable in training so it can predict this. Okay, and so if we look at the uh, outcome, actually, let's go through the rest of this history plot. You can do points. So if I change this, it should change. It did not. We'll just go. Oh, there it goes. It took a second. My computer was thinking about it. So here are time points for each day as we go through. Okay, it's tr struggling real hard to do it again. Oh, I misclicked. <laughs> oh, man. Okay, well, it's struggling real hard, so I'm just going to put it back to line. Uh, but you saw it for a second. You saw the frame for a second. Hopefully, I don't get rid of that. You can show linear or logistic growth, and then you can actually uh, make your interval larger or smaller. My computer seems to be struggling with this calculation right here. You can see I may have, uh, have made it mess up somehow. I, I don't know. I'm Hopefully, it just stopped moving. <laughs> So let's go into the model. So let's so that's a history plot. You kind of want to get the historical data. Uh, it's still struggling. And so what it says here is before fitting the profit uh, to the data set, it's best to visualize and inspect the history first. So as you can see here, there was a large growth at the beginning of 2020. And then the pandemic, I guess, really reduced the amount of people that were looking for statistic advice. And so it fell. And then my video came out. <laughs> in july slash august saying a new version has dropped y'all and then everyone started coming on it there you go see you can see that like the stock market it goes up and down up and down up and down up and down and so profit's going to tell you whether or not you've got projections uh, upward or downward depending on how the uh data shakes out so just a brief glance of the data reveals a global increasing trend by the number of visits to the jasp web page and we have our editing functions right here check out another video where i go through all of that there are also two points in the time series where the ten trend seems to change these so-called change points will not be a problem for profit because the model can take them into account okay so let's talk about the model okay so max change points in this uh, in this model is two because there were two releases and change point range 0.8 uh laplace prior tau is 0.05 Okay, this is uh, your priors okay, for prediction. Okay, and then estimation. So either you can use maximum a posteriori, or you can use the Markov chain Monte Carlo, and this takes 2,000 samples, although you can specify how many samples. This is kind of like bootstrapping, but not, not exactly. And then you can specify your prediction. So these values, are not, these values aren't bad, and I would um, recommend copying these values for uh, models in the future. Okay, seasonalities, we've got um, weekly, so if you look at your historical graph here, we go from January all the way to April, and these are up and down. So the way that you can handle this is by doing just a weekly period of seven days. Okay, So weekly is seven days. 10 is our normal prior for uh, sigma squared. And then we have a Fourier order of three. You know, I'm not entirely sure what the Fourier order and multiplicative is. Let's see if we can. Um, here we go. Weekly. Right. So here is the seasonality plot. So if you break it down with uh, this line here, the black line shows you the weekly trend from any given weekday. And so if we take, let's see, Friday is a good 0% baseline here. So Monday through Friday, you can expect weekly trends to be above and the weekend to be below. And then it goes back up as we go. So that that is a, a way to, to check trends. So we can close model there. Prediction is the main meat here. So there are 14 periods, 14 periods, 
Uh, I'm not entirely sure how they're defining 14 periods, I guess, days. There are 14 days in the prediction. And then you can save your predictions if you'd like. Okay. Or you can do non-periodical and specify in unit of days. Because date here is in, in days, you want to do that. So what it looks like to me is that they did uh, two weeks per period, 14 days per period which um, in 10 months is somewhere around, I want to say hmm, 40, 40 ish periods, something like that. Yeah, about 40 periods. I'm not entirely sure where in October they ended, but yeah, so it's about 40 ish periods here. Um, and then we're going to close that and then we're going to go into evaluation. They have cross validation checked off the change point table, which is right here. Um, and that's going to give us the uh, where the change occurs, even though we don't have release into change point. And then performance X uh, metrics, you can use mean square error. MSE, the root mean square error, RMSE, which is a uh, favorite of people doing uh, SEM and factor models. And then the mean absolute percentage error or MAPE. OK, so we're going to go through that as well. And then plots. We can get additional plots, which tells us the trend, showing us the change points overall, showing data points, showing change points. And then we'll go through all of that. And then the posterior distributions. OK, let's look at this output. So we already looked at the history plot. Now let's look at the posterior summary table. Growth rate is uh, K, offset is M, and residual variance as a sigma, which is uh, which was this value nope, right here. OK, so the summary of the posterior distribution shows a positive growth rate, positive growth rate, indicating an increasing trend in the number of visits before the first change point. OK, so here is what is referenced by that. OK, 95 percent credible interval is narrow and far away from zero. OK, here we go. Narrow and far away from zero. I mean, yeah, that's 0.17, something around there, which means the trend estimate is almost certainly positive. OK, the MCMC diagnostic statistics, so R hat. ESS and ESS bulk and tail suggest that all change converge and enough MCMC samples were drawn to precisely estimate parameter statistics. So you need pretty big data sets and this posterior summary table will tell you if you have enough for that. OK. All right. The change point summary. This is really important. So we have a change point at 425 or April 25th, 2020. So we can see it's somewhere around here, right? Because we're going up and then at some point we go down and that tells us that's a down growth. OK. It's negative. And then we have another change point at August 13th. After my video came out, no, I have no, I'm just kidding, guys. I have no idea when my video came out saying that there was a new release, although I have been doing that consistently for a couple of years now. And then so that <laughs> positive change point is right here. And you can see by these mean numbers that those that those change points are based on how much change there is. So a smaller mean, negative or positive, is going to reflect a lower change point. So less, but not that much less. And then this massive change here in August is a significant change. And so you can see the mean here is quite big. OK quite big. I know I keep scrolling back up to the history plot, but it's a useful plot. Okay. Um, the two change points were automatically fitted to the data. So you could also put in your own change points. So if we converted release to a continuous variable and plugged it in there, it would incorporate those change points. But these were automatically marked by profit. They roughly coincide with the start and end of summer break in the academic year. Yeah, sure. Also, it's 2020. During summer break, JAS is usually less frequently used by universities and less people visit the web, less people visit the website. I, though I will say that researchers could still use the website. Maybe that's for this downtrend here. I don't know. <laughs> but yes, the intuition is supported by the first change point leading to a negative growth rate, which is right here, the negative 3.97. So here's the growth rate. OK, and then you subtract uh, this from it and you end up with a negative number and a decreasing trend. The second change point cone starts with the start of the semester and leads to a sharp positive change in growth increasing trend. This is a very intuitive explanation for why there is a change here. Also my video. <laughs> and then here are the 14 periods. So the, again, these were um, biweekly, uh, excuse me, these were um, 14 days worth of this is not all the periods, my bad. I, <laughs> Next, we have the simulated historical forecast table, and this is our 14 day period. OK, so two weeks and it tells you the MAPE, which again is the evaluation mean absolute percentage error. So mean absolute percentage error. OK, displays the mean absolute percentage error for a horizon of 14 days. The error roughly increases with predictions further within the horizon. This means that predictions are less accurate for the days that are farther in the future. Right. So you don't want your forecast to be too far into the future. I would. So if you put a 28 day forecast, a 30 day forecast, a 60 day, 90 day forecast, you're looking uh, your, your percentages here are going to increase and, you know, too far into the future with not enough data, not enough predictive capacity. Here are the forecast plots. So this is where we would find out whether or not we see trends increasing or decreasing. So this is the overall forecast plot contains predictions for the data set as well as for 14 future days. The wave like form of the prediction curve is due to the weekly seasonality included in the model. Yep. So it goes back up and down. And we did that seasonality right here every seven days. The prediction seems to fit the data quite well. And except for two intervals in early April and September right here. So April. And September is what I guess is their marking right here. Those those two. The future predictions can be expected to have an error range between 10 percent and 20 percent of the true values as indicated by the simulated historical forecast. And you can double check what that means here, because 10 percent 
is, I mean, 11% is really the lowest here, but then it goes up to 21%. So you can kind of estimate there within the two weeks that the vast majority of the future predictions are going to range between 10 and 20% of error. Okay, so you could say, all right, well, next week we're going to have 3,000 views. And so you're probably going to be 10 to 20% off in that for the next seven weeks. And then seasonality plots. So this is the seven week average or the seven day period right here. I, I already alluded to at the beginning of the video, but the model includes a weekly seasonality effect seven days, which is displayed here at the beginning of the week. The number of visits seems to increase roughly 30% of the average trend. That's what uh, I pointed out right here. OK, you know, Friday is sort of that middle part right there. Towards the end of the week, the visits decrease down to roughly negative 40% of the average less activity on the weekends, of course, obviously. OK, these are the parameter plots. This tells you how good your uh, parameter estimate is. So we had a growth rate in between what it was. Let's scroll back up here. Uh, 0.581. OK, so it tells you, right, 0.581. There it is. OK, and then offset and then the re residual variance. There you go. So that is all you need. Honestly, all you need. I'm going to leave this uh, open so you can pause it. But uh, that's how you do profit, how you use profit in Jasp. If you have any comments, suggestions, feedback on how I can improve my use of time series analysis and profit, please leave those in the comments down below. I appreciate any feedback you get, even if you give, even if you tell me, dude, Dr. Swan, you are so wrong on some of the things that you just said. My bad. Just learning through it, going through what I already know about time series, statistics, that kind of thing, and seeing whether or not I could use a new model. Thanks for watching this video, and I hope to see you in the next one.